Welcome to the drawing board. Today we're talking about the increasingly uncertain condition of state and local government finances. The federal government isn't the only part of the public sector with a debt overhang problem. Many state and municipal finances across the nation are also stressed. This can lead to trouble meeting their financial obligations, ranging from pensions to debt payments. The Federal Reserve Banks of Cleveland and Atlanta have formed a financial monitoring team to study this situation. This team has been looking at pension funds and municipal finance with an eye toward the implications for the wider economy and the financial system. Here's what we know for sure. State and local government debt now totals somewhere between three and four trillion dollars, depending on which source you look at. We also know that at least 5,500 different entities, such as school districts, county governments, and other debt issuers, are active in the municipal bond market. Some of these entities are in serious financial straits, and some are in jeopardy of defaulting on their debt. One of the many stresses on state and local government budgets is the condition of their public pension plans. By some estimates, more than half of the country's state and local plans could see their pension funds dry up by as soon as the year 2034. We need to know a lot more to fully understand state and local government finances. With hardly any up-to-date comparable data on their fiscal health, especially at the local level, it's pretty hard to figure out how much of a risk this sector really poses to the financial system and to the economy. Yet, it's crucial that we find out. Let's talk about public pensions first. These represent an enormous financial obligation on the part of state and local governments, and pension plans themselves are major players in the financial sector. Most are what's known as defined benefit plans. This means that the plan sponsor, whether it's the state, the city, the county, or another entity, has promised to pay employees a specified income stream based on their years of service, final average salary, and some other things. It's a lot to pay out. Depending on the assumptions in different academic and government studies, right now the largest 126 public pension plans in America are underfunded by anywhere between $800 billion and $4 trillion. The ability of public pensions to meet their financial obligations depends on three things. First, the amount they have promised to pay to retirees. Second, how much their governments contribute to the plans. And finally, the returns the funds make on investments. State and local governments are supposed to adjust their contributions every year to make sure they can meet their future payment obligations. But fewer and fewer government employers are actually doing that. In fact, after making all their other spending choices and commitments, most state and local governments have put themselves in a position where they have hardly any money left over to squeeze out for the required pension contributions. Now, it's true that strong investment gains could help close the funding gap over time. But offsetting all of the losses that pension plans incurred during the financial crisis could take many good years of returns well above the historical 8% return rate, and that's obviously not a sure bet. Many plans could end up in a self-reinforcing downward spiral if they have to dip into their principal to pay benefits to retirees. That means that each year they have a smaller base to generate investment returns. As the base gets smaller, so could the investment returns. What's daunting about that prospect is the way fund managers might respond. If they can't count on governments to replenish them with new contributions, they might start gambling on riskier investments in the hope of making gains. They might win big with such a strategy, or they might lose big. And if that happened to enough plans, it would be a headache for more than the public pensioners themselves, depending on who's on the hook for paying the promised benefits. Now, one way to avoid such a scenario would be for state and local governments to simply increase their contributions to public plans. Otherwise, they might need to reform their pension systems. 
They could alter the terms for benefits, make them less generous, raise retirement ages, or change cost of living adjustments, to name just a few options. But reforming public pensions is a bigger challenge than it sounds. Reform-minded legislators and even voters might want to change the system, but public pensioners have rights. They have been promised certain benefits and, quite reasonably, they are afforded certain protections. For example, at least 27 states appear to protect what employees have already earned as part of their benefits, or what they will earn in the future according to their existing contracts. So right there, lawmakers in those 27 states are limited in their ability to ease their funding shortfalls by eating into promised benefits. Most states think of public pensions as contracts between employees and employers. So reforms often require the government to show it as both reasonable and necessary grounds for making changes. And that can be a pretty high hurdle. The city of Omaha, Nebraska found that out when it tried to change cost of living adjustments for some of its retirees. Even though the city said it could go bankrupt if it could not alter the plan, the court wasn't moved and the plan stayed the same. But some changes, like modifying pension terms for new hires, have proven to be easier. Unfortunately, that will take only a small bite out of most funding gaps. The fiscal challenges that many state and local governments are facing could eventually play out in the municipal bond market. Even now that the recession has ended, a lot of cities and counties across the country are struggling to make ends meet. That's raising doubts about their ability to keep up with debt payments. Municipal bonds are a popular investment for many households and other investors. Although it's unlikely, in an extreme event, the municipal bond market could fall out of favor. State and local governments might suddenly face higher borrowing costs, and there could be broader consequences for the financial system. How likely is it that we'll see an increasing number of municipal bond defaults? Well, we're not sure, but at the state level, the probability of a government default seems extremely low. After all, state governments maintain the authority to raise taxes to cover any shortfalls. They can essentially demand that taxpayers hand over more money. To be sure, no government wants it to get that far. For most, the market discipline of higher borrowing costs is enough to keep them meeting their debt obligations in the first place. The way we see it, even a large, isolated default seems quite unlikely to trigger anything close to the systemic crisis we experienced in 2008. It might very well cause a temporary contraction of credit as investors turn away from the municipal bond market and move into safer havens. But that's a tamer scenario than a contagion of municipal bond defaults and big losses in the financial system. On the other hand, if the financial crisis taught us anything, it's that unexpected events happen, especially in the highly interconnected financial system, which is why here at the Federal Reserve, we continue to shed light on this particular dark corner of the economy. Something to think about until the next time on the drawing board.